Being an economist, quite a few people have asked me over the last few weeks, what would it mean to the economy if the UK left the EU? Well, the answer is, you don't really need to be an economist to work that one out. Would we be better off paying £50 million a day or not? Would we be better off being barred from entering into trade deals with countries around the world or not? Would we be better off complying with a myriad of different regulations or having some degree of flexibility? I don't feel like I'm really having to use my qualifications there. But as an economist, you are always worried. Are you missing anything? If only there was a real-world example of a country that was doing well for itself that was outside the EU. Well, there is an example. There's the rest of the world, such as Singapore, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Hong Kong, Canada and Australia. They all have smaller populations than us, are not in the EU, and all have a higher GDP per capita than us. Half of these examples are in the European Economic Area, so enjoy free trade with Europe, but as they are outside the EU, they are able to enter into trade agreements with countries around the world. Iceland, with a population of only 330,000, has just signed a trade deal with China. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world, but are currently not allowed to do so. We have seen Moody's, the leading credit rating agency, say that Exit would only present modest and manageable credit challenges. The head of the British Chamber of Commerce say that the UK's long-term prospects are brighter outside the EU, and 250 business leaders, acting in a personal capacity, backing Brexit. So it's not that the economic argument for staying in the EU is weak, it's non-existent. So why are we seeing all these scare stories? We're told it will be a risk, or it will be a shock. Or who will be shocked? The major companies that have spent the last few decades heavily lobbying the Commission to get legislation that helps them and that blocks new entrants? One such example of EU lobbying is in the 1990s. The EU was lobbied by car manufacturers, like BMW, Volkswagen and Dalma, into passing pro-diesel laws. This was positioned as being good for the environment, but was at stark odds with the rest of the world, which were adopting hybrid and electric technology to meet their carbon reductions. Why was the rest of the world doing that? Because diesel releases toxic gases which has led to countless deaths from lung cancer right across Europe. We only have to look at all the companies that have been given EU subsidies, like the hundreds of millions given to tobacco manufacturers, our money, or £21 million of taxpayers' money going on swimming pools in Guadeloupe, or how after Big Pharma spent £40 million on lobbying, they're getting the exact terms they want regarding clinical trials written to the TTIP. Just look on Integrity Watch. Last year alone, there were 353 reported, reported lobby groups that spent over €100,000 lobbying the EU. 76 of them spent more than a million euros, and those are the lobbyists that we know about last year, the ones that report for activities and expenditure as lobbying. There are now around 30,000 lobbyists based in Brussels. You can see from maps how they've located their offices right round those of the EU. Well, who else would be shocked? Perhaps the political class that rely on getting a cosy job from the Commission after they finish their current roles. The President of the Commission is paid more than Obama, despite not receiving any votes from the public. The Commission has an annual entertainment budget of around £7 million, and commissioners often get their own private jets. Between 2007 and 2012, Tony Blair was paid to be peace envoy to the Middle East. For that, he received £2 million a year. He has recently landed himself the job there in the role to promote tolerance. Our money, our taxpayers' money, going to Tony Blair to fulfil roles that are offensive for that man to hold. A man who would never win another election for anything ever again in this country. Who else would be shocked? Perhaps the cottage industry around the EU, the companies responsible for moving every month 2,500 boxes and 1,000 officials from Brussels to Strasbourg through a combination of lorries and privately chartered trains and jets for the executives for four days, and then moving them all back again, at an annual cost of over £100 million. Or the EU's own TV channel, at a cost of over £70,000 per hour, but only has 900 viewers at peak. Those are some of the people that might be shocked, in an economic sense, were we to leave. But here are some of the things that I find shocking. I find it shocking to be told that the EU is good as it has given us equal rights. I really expected to believe that absent of a European body there had been no progression in our laws at all over the last 43 years? Well look at the legislation we passed before joining what was then the EEC. The Race Relations Act in 1965 against racial discrimination. The Equal Pay Act of 1970 against discrimination by gender. And that was then. We really expected to believe that unlike nearly every other country in the world, our legislation would not have continued to progress at all Absent the EU? Well, even America now has gay marriage. We're told that the EU is good because it makes us more international. Well, in some ways it does. In other ways, it has had the opposite effect. Net migration is currently sat around 320,000 people a year. To house that many people, we need to build a city the size of Birmingham every three years. 
In order to keep the number down to 320,000, the government has imposed harsh restrictions on everyone from outside the EU. Well, how is that fair? To have a total open-door policy to 27 other countries, but to slam the door shut on the rest of the world? It is only if we were to leave the EU we could apply a fair system that is not based on where people are born. We are told the EU is good as it gives our farmers a subsidy. Well, yes it does, although the largest food producing recipients are Tate and Lyle and Nestle, but all of this is with our money. On a net basis, so after you deduct the subsidies we get back, we give £9 billion a year to the EU. That's around £300 from every single household, or roughly the cost of operating and maintaining all the trains and rail network in the country. And that's assuming we would want to keep all the subsidies in place. I'm not sure Kellogg's needs taxpayers' money. And all of this is before the cost of having to comply with the legislation from the EU. It's far harder for it to work out, as we can't tell for sure what laws would have passed anyway without the EU, but estimates have been in the range of 10 to £100 billion a year. A figure towards the low end would take the cost per household up at around £700 a year, and that is far, far more than the entire of UK government spending cuts over the last six years. But the argument to leave EU isn't really about economics, shocking or otherwise. In 2005, both France and the Netherlands held a referendum on the EU constitution. Both said no, well, not ni. However, every part of that constitution was then pushed through the Lisbon Treaty. That's not just undemocratic, that's anti-democratic. Well, not every part. They left out the wording on an ever closer union, but here's what President Barroso said in 2012. We advocate further integration within the euro area, it is now evident that this is indispensable for the sustainability of our common currency. Our economic relations bind us all, euro area members and non-euro members alike. Our futures are linked. I am not sure whether the urgency of this is fully understood in all the capitals. There are so many people throughout history who have fought and died for the right to vote, the right for self-determination through political representation. It was the basis of the English Civil War, within which one in ten adult males in this country died, and the suffragette movement, women throwing themselves under horses so they could gain a say on how this country is run rather than being treated as subjects. But within the space of a generation, we have given this away, and now have laws set by people that none of us voted for. Democracy is important and the lack of which is the primary cause of all the corruption in the EU. How a commission can set its own budget and has now gone 21 years without its auditors giving its accounts a clean bill of health, and there have been so many scandals over the years that it is now impossible to keep count. If you have a problem with the government in this country, you can vote them out. The only people in Brussels who can elect do not determine the legislation. Well, what is taxation without representation? It's theft. And what is ruling without representation? Well, it's tyranny. And are things going to get any better when the EU finally gets the full army and police force that it wants? Even the most basic right, one which was first defined in the UK, habeas corpus, the right to seek relief from unlawful imprisonment as set out in the Magna Carta, has been taken away by the EU. The European arrest warrant has led to people, British citizens, being detained without charge for three years in foreign prisons. Well, just imagine for a moment that we were not in the EU, and you were asked, would you like to have lawmakers that you can't vote out? Would you like to sign up to the only trade bloc in the world that is not growing, and in so doing not be allowed to enter agreements with other countries, and for the privilege of this, you will be asked to pay £50 million a day? Well, what would you say to that? No, no, no! Please vote on the 23rd of June. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to regain our most basic freedoms, our dignity and our democracy. Vote to leave the EU. The rationale for Europe today is not peace anymore, it's power. In terms of uh, your future, are you or anybody around you taking steps to make it possible for you to assume a new EU presidency, to be the president of, of the EU? <laughs> You know, when I was asked this question today, I said, look, I'm doing the job I'm doing at the moment. And the one thing I've learned over a, a very long period in politics is don't speculate about things in the future, because who knows? Are you taking yourself out of uh, consideration? No, I'm simply saying, Christiane, that when I'm here today in Palestine, uh, working on the issues to do with the Palestinian economy in my quartet role, that's what I want to talk about. And when and if I want to talk about something else, I'll, I'll do it at a, at a future moment, if you don't mind.